Assalamu alaikum. This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org slash donate. As little as $10 a month can help people find life-changing guidance. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtina innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Allahumma allimna ma yinfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna wa zidna min fadlika ilman wa amlan wa qurban ya arhamur rahimin Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah it's the last few moments of Ramadan there's a you still have a couple of hours left and alhamdulillah it's raining <laughs> so it's the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descending and as we said bi dhikrihim tanzil rahamat by mentioning the righteous uh, the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down so <clears throat> let's look now so we're looking at sayyidina musa alayhi salatu wasalam and i said that sayyidina musa is out of all of the prophets mentioned in the quran he's the one that most resembles sayyidina muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasalam in uh, especially in, in 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 the struggles he had to go through um like i said uh, <clears throat> the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam after Allah, after hunain after battle after the battle of hunain he went to taif came back and then he distributed the booty and there was a man called dhul khuwaisira and he went up to the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after he divided the booty and he said um he said, "Inna hadhi qismatun mabtughiya bihi wajhullah." This division that you've done, Allah's Allah wasn't the intent in it, and you know. Uh, so obviously, this is a very offensive statement. If the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if he's not going to be be fair and just, then who is? And he said exactly that. Waihak uh, inna maadil faman, you know, or something to that effect. That you know, shame on you, basically. You know, like if I'm not going to be fair, who is? And then he said, Rahim Allahu Akhi Musa, may Allah be merciful and kind to my brother Musa. Laqad Udiya bi akthara min hadha fa sabar. Indeed, he was offended and he, with, with more than this, with worse than this, and he, he remained patient. Right? So, um, you know, there's verses about this you know, uh, where he said, Ya Bani Israel, Lima tu udunani wa qad ta'alamuna anni rasulullahi ilaykum. Why do you keep harming you, harming me when you know for a fact that I'm the messenger of Allah to you? So it was there, obviously, you know, the issue. And, you know, so it's obviously criticizing the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, with this was obviously, uh, you know, terrible, terrible statement, terrible crime. And, you know, uh, subhanAllah. Um, so, <clears throat> so what happened? So Sayyidina Musa, he's, like I said, he's the most... The one that resembles the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the most, um, and his story starts uh, being narrated in Mecca, and it's not chronological in the Quran. Um, Allah subhanahu wa taala he mentions things at relevant places, and in some places he'll mention, lest it is a whole conversation. Allah might men- mention one part of it in one place because it's relevant, and then another part in a different place because it's relevant there. So that's how the story of, of Sayyidina Musa goes. <coughs> how did it start? So, like I said yesterday, either there was some prophecy or somehow Fir'aun heard that there's going to be a child, and I think this is a biblical narration, that there's going to be a child who's going to cause your downfall. So he thought, you know what, let's kill all of these children from Bani Israel. So Bani Israel had been enslaved at this point, let's kill them all. Or he's just, you know, being a tyrant and he just wants to kill, you know, kill off Bani Israel, but he still benefits from them. So killing, you know, the male children in one year and, you know, leaving them the next year. So they still have a, had a slave workforce. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and what for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as, um, and Fir'aun, the one who has many, many huge uh, pyramids. And obviously these pyramids are, you know, extremely difficult to construct, very intricate structures. So, you know, moving these huge rocks, you know, it's not as if he did any of the heavy lifting. Right. So we, we start, <clears throat> let's let's look at Sidna Musa's birth. Right. So we said his father's Imran. Before his birth, he's got a sister. Um, we don't know her name, um, but he's got a sister. And he had, he's got a brother called Harun, which we're unsure of, is he older or younger than him? 
So Allah says, for example, in Surah Taha, وَلَقَدْ مَنَنَّ عَلَيْكَ مَرَّةً أُخْرَى That we sent, we gave you an unthinkable gift, you know, another time as well. إِذْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّكَ مَا يُوحَى When we uh, inspired and revealed to your mother that which was revealed. So what did he reveal? He inspired the following verse. But this is not revelation. It's not wahi in in the sense that a person is a prophet and the prophet re receives this wahi. It's called ilham. It's a, it's a degree of inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the prophet told us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that in the, before us there were people who were muhaddathun, people who were spoken to. And he said if any of these people exist in our ummah, it's Umar, right? And so Umar many a time you know, he intuited what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to reveal. And, you know, <clears throat> he had this ilham, right? Very clear. And after him, many others of the righteous have had it, right? And if if, if a righteous lady from Bani Israel can be given it, then, you know, the righteous of our ummah can be given it more so. <clears throat> so Allah subhanahu wa and so he says, when we inspired this, uh, something to your mother. So this ilham and the content of ilham, is usually specific to a person or it might be Allah might be communicating to one person go tell that person something um, but in general uh, ilham will not contradict the sharia you can't have someone come today or tomorrow look i've just had this ilham from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right no more fasting ever again no more prayers you're all sorted right it doesn't work like that so you cannot contradict the sharia and the sharia is always you know uh, over over it so it might be particular to <clears throat> this one one individual so now musa alayhi salam his mother is pregnant and she's expecting a child but she doesn't know the gender right you know there's no way of getting a scan so she she doesn't know the gender she's waiting and she's just so i want you to imagine the emotions and the build up to this because this is a test for her right and so she's waiting, is it going to be a boy? Is it going to be a girl? If it's a girl, Alhamdulillah, it'll be safe. She'll be safe, she won't be killed. What if it's a boy, right? And then what if I give birth to a boy and then they go and kill him? What am I going to do, right? So a mother, obviously, expecting a mother. And it's, I suppose it's, um, it's, it's different and it, it, it's, the mother has a connection to this unborn child because the mother can feel the child growing within her, moving within her. So, you know, throughout the pregnancy, she's feeling this child within her. So developing this bond becomes easy for the mother. mother. And this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, imagine if there was an adjustment period, you know, the child's born and she needs six weeks to just get used to the idea that, you know, I've got a kid. Um, the kid needs things at birth. So Allah prepares the mother. That's why there's this whole nine month gestation. So, <clears throat> so Allah, what does He inspire her? Aniqdi fihi fi tabuti, right? And the tabut is a box. It's just a wooden box. And I know people use Moses' basket and whatever, but it's here. It's a wooden box, right? And it's used twice in the Quran in two contexts. One here and one context in Surah Al-Baqarah that talks about the Ark of the Covenant, in which some some of the relics of Musa and Harun alayhi salatu were kept. Uh, and Bani Israel lost them in a battle. They used to keep them with them for barakah. They were lost in a battle. Um, <clears throat> the enemies took them. And then when Talut became the king of Bani Israel to lead them into battle, a sign of his king kinghood was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the angels bring those relics back to Bani Israel. So, so he says, Iqdifihi, toss him. It's quite interesting, this use, this use of you know wording toss him why would she toss him why would she not just put him gently into the thing it means i mean allahu alam then the implication is that you know keep hold of him as long as you can right <clears throat> keep hold of him as long as you can and at the last moment when you fear him for his life there's more detail we're going to mention again when you fear for his life put him in, in into the into the yum the yum is a word for a river or a sea a large body of water uh, and then he said that the the, uh, the the river will cast him onto the shore, and and his uh, my enemy and his enemy will take him. So Allah's enemy is Fir'aun because he's saying, "I am Ana Rabbukum al -a'la, I am your Lord Most High." And he's he's the enemy of Musa and the enemy of all of Bani Israel, but specifically Musa, right? 
<coughs> and then Allah says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِّي And I cast love upon you. Meaning, it's like love is like a cloth that Allah put on Musa. And anyone that wants to look at Musa will see this cloth, right? So basically, um, well, I'll, I'll go into this again. And so that you could be, um, you could be constructed under my gaze. Meaning that you, you grow and you develop as a person, uh, as a child into an adult, but under my gaze, right? It, it's literally as uh, literally as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is building him like you build something with Lego piece by piece, right? And they're talking about his sister, but um <clears throat> let's go back, let's go to Surah Al-Qasas. Surah Al-Qasas is the one that really talks about this story, right? So Tasi Meem Tilka Ayatul Kitab, Tasi Meem, a challenge to Quraysh that you know produce this is your language, produce a Quran like it, right? And those are the lofty verses of the clear book, right? And نَتْلُوا عَلَيْكَ مِنْ نَبَأِ مُوسَى وَفِرْعَوْنَ بِالْحَقِّ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ we, we recite to you something of the tremendous consequential story of Musa and Fir'aun. It's consequential because Iman and Kufr can be derived from this, right? Which side of the fence are you going to be on? Uh, for a people who believe. So isn't this for all of humanity? Yes. But, is, but who, believe, who who benefits? The believers. So ultimately, it's there for the believers. Yeah? It's like um, you, you leave some food outside uh, for any, you know, a cat or a bird or whatever. Uh, but it's it's the neighbor's dog that comes and eats it. So ultimately, you know, it's been left out for that dog, you know. So the, the one who benefits from it is the one who is actually there for. Then Allah says, Inna fir'awna ala fil ard. This, These are the five things we talked about yesterday. He crossed limits in the land and divided and conquered its people, treated them you know, like they were extremely weak and poor and manipulated them. He was killing uh, the, the males and leaving the, the, the females alive and he was a really corrupt individual. Now this is beautiful. The Bani Israel were downtrodden, right? And they were, you know, bullied, let's just say, in the worst way. And Allah says, We want to cast, uh, to bestow our unthankable, you know, huge favor on those who are treated like this, treated weak, like, like they're weak in the land and exploited. And we want to make them imams, people who, you know, Others look up to and follow, and you know, <coughs> and and you know they follow the example, and we want to make them the inheritors of what earth, of the sacred land, Palestine, right? وَنُمَكِّنَ لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَانَ وَهَامَانَ وَجُنُودُهُمَا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ And we want to make them firm and establish, you know, uh, have a secure footing in the land, and we want to show Fir'aun and Haman, one of his ministers, and their and their armies, what they were afraid of, and they're afraid of this child coming and yeah, taking their kingdom away. So what is what happened? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa awhina ila ummi Musa an ardi'i." So we revealed, we inspired the mother of Musa. We said, "Ardi'i, suckle him, breastfeed him." Right. So as soon as he's born, feed him. Right. This is really important. During the first three days after birth, during the first three days. When a lady is uh, breastfeeding, um, it's not milk that she's giving the child. It's something called colostrum, right? This yellow liquid, which is full of nutrients and full of um, <clears throat> antibodies. And it's, it's full of stuff that the child needs. And it's very, very beneficial for the child. So, you know, do what you need to do to look after him to make sure, <clears throat> you know, he, he's going to be fine. فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ And when you're, when you're scared of him, Sorry, when you're scared for him, when you're afraid that something will happen to him, then toss him into, into the river, right? And <clears throat> so at that point, it's toss him into the river when you're afraid for him. So these people were going out and looking for which children are born. So is it, has this child been born yet or not? And, you know, they have spies and they know who's, you know, if anyone's pregnant or whatever. Uh, maybe she got away, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that they didn't find out for her. But there's a point where they come knocking on the door, open up in the name of the law, right? Have you, you know, has, has there been a child here, whatever, you know, so slip out and go put him into the basket. Wala takhafi, wala tahzani, right? And don't be afraid, don't be scared, and don't be sad. This is beautiful. Uh, why? 
So, yeah, subhanAllah. Is she going to be scared? Of course. She's human. If she's going to be sad, she's obviously going to feel sadness. I've just put my baby, my newborn baby into this basket. And, you know, uh, you know, it's not something a mother can do easily. I, I really doubt that. You know, after giving birth to a child, I don't think it, you know, it's certainly not easy. This is like we talk, when we talked about Sayyidina Ibrahim, alayhi salatu salam, the tests that people go through and the tests that the righteous go through. This is, you know, really high up there. This is really, really high up there in in the scale of difficult tests. You can just emo, you know, feel. So she's not got to this rank, you know, just by, by sitting around. She's obviously close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she's got really high, strong iman. Yet, you know, Allah's telling her, reassuring her, don't be afraid, don't be sad. Why? Inna raduhu ilayki. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a very powerful construction in the Arabic language to say, we will most certainly, without a doubt, bring him back to you. It's very, very similar. Uh, Allah subhanahu Surah Al-Qasr is most beautiful now, right? <clears throat> the same surah at the end of it, one of the last verses is, was revealed when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was forced to leave Makkah. Otherwise, they would have assassinated him, right? And um, when he left Makkah, he looked back, looked down at the city, and he said, you are the, you're the most beloved of earth. This is earth Allah's created. You're, you're the most beloved spot of it to me. And if your people hadn't forced me out, I wouldn't have left, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, إِنَّ الَّذِي فَرَضَ عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لَرَادُّكَ إِلَى مَعَاد Indeed, he who has made the Quran obligatory on you for the Prophet to teach it and you know, spread his message, he will certainly bring you back to Makkah. Is the intent, but he doesn't say Makkah, he, he will certainly bring you back to the place of return, right? So it's this, it's emphasized in many ways. And Allah, um, what you notice is <clears throat> the righteous say that, um, whoever recites this verse in a place that he loves, Allah will bring him back to it, right? That's why, when if you go to Makkah, Medina, you see people, especially from the Indo Pak, they're writing it on the wall as well. That's also another thing, they write it on the wall with their fingers. Allah brings them back. Um, <clears throat> there was a, one of the awliya from Damascus who passed away, I think, in 2010 or thereabouts. Sheikh Ahmed Habbal, right? And, uh, you know, subhanAllah. There, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of the awliya called the Abdal, right? So um, the Abdal basically, it means the, the, the substitutes. They have a rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a role. And when one of them dies, someone else is promoted and you know, subs he's substituted with, with another. So Sheikh Ahmed Habal, was, they said he was one of them. Uh, one of my friends went to visit him and uh, just like a couple of days before he passed away. And people had seen, seen him, seen the Prophet وسلم, in a dream. And he was referring to him, you know, the, my man in Damascus, you know, praising him. And so my friend went to him and said, Kifahadukum Sidi, you know, how are you? Everything okay? And he said, I'm waiting for the journey i.e. to the akhirah uh, when the substitute comes so when someone's there who takes his place I'm, go I'm off and Sheikh Ahmed Habbal um, I lost uh, I forgot how many hajjas and umrahs that he did in his life like you know loads something like 70, 80 whatever altogether trips down there uh, he, he passed away he was well over 110 when he passed away and you know multiple trips and he would recite this he, or he would write this verse on the wall every time he went allah took him back but the last time he went he just didn't end up doing it you know the taqdeer of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which just he wasn't meant to be uh ta'ala wa radiya so he said we're certainly going to bring him back to you promise number one and we're certainly going to make him uh, into a messenger promise number two now what's beautiful is um there are certain styles and motifs in the Arabic language, and this this uh, this verse employs some of these. So in it are <clears throat> in it are two two commands. Uh, we, we he said we, we reveal to the mother of Musa, suckle him, breastfeed him, and throw him into the uh, river. Two commands, two prohibitions. So two do's and now two don'ts. Don't be afraid and don't be scared. And then two promises, right? That we're going to bring him back and we're going to make him into a messenger. Right, right, and so, subhanAllah. so the, 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 the followers of Fir'aun 
picked him up. So literally, like as, as if you'd find a coin on the fl a floor, they picked him up, liyakuna lahum, and they picked him up to take him to Fir'aun to show him what's what's going on. But uh, in English, but the way the word uh, wording is constructed is Allah saying that they picked him up only for him to be a source of only for him to become their enemy and a source of grief for them meaning they picked him up with one intention but because of what they will choose and how they will be he'll end up at the end of the you know uh, at the very end he'll end up being their enemy and you know uh, and and uh, you know a cause of cause of grief for them right but this was their choice right so you know they have one idea about how things will turn out so in if we go back to surah al taha we see what happens right <clears throat> allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, no, the, the, his mother says to to, um, to his sister, who's older now, seven, eight, something like this. She's intelligent, and she said, "Qusihi, go follow him." Right? As I said in the very first uh, of these uh, lectures, um, the word "qissa," uh, its root is to follow someone's footsteps. Right? So she uses this word here, "Qusihi, go follow him." And so, basically, what's happening? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that. <clears throat> The box has been put in, into the, into the Nile, <coughs> and it's going downstream. And Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, you know, still a baby and literally hours old, if that, right? And he's going down, and as he the Nile goes past Fir'aun's palace, and as it's going, there, it ends up getting uh, taken onto the shore, right? His sister's at a very, you know, she's at a safe distance. If it capsizes, right, um, what's, you know, what's she going to do? You know, what will happen? You know, she'll go there, you know, she's going to pull him out or whatever. Um, this sort of thing. But what's interesting is, I just want to just focus on something, is um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, um, وَأَصْبَحَ فُؤَادِ أُمِّ مُوسَى فَارِغًا Allah says that the heart of M Musa's mother became empty, and we we imply what's implied is empty of everything besides Musa. So everything of this dunya at that point she didn't care about anyone or anything. The only thing that's of concern, my baby, my baby, my baby, right? And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uses the word fuad, which is a very beautiful word. It comes from fa'ad al-nar, and fa'ad al-nar is like when a fire is leaping and the flames are rising and it's, it's just moving about the movement in this fire and it's why is the word for a heart to use like this because the heart feels emotions right and just you know imagine the range of emotions that you've been through in your life it, it might be extreme sadness it, you know they say you've burned my heart right um, or anger or happiness or whatever the emotions stir within you so it's like a flame moving about so this heart, and why is this word used here right now? She's full of these emotions. What's she going to be thinking? My baby, uh, what if he dies? I'll have killed him, right? She's going to be blaming, you know, potentially blaming herself, getting ready for this possibility, all this worry, all this fear, because this is, you know, the test. The test was putting him into the in, into the river, but there's a harder element of that test, which is sitting there, not having any control over anything and waiting for things to play out. Allah says he's promised he's going to bring him back to me. But how, you know, he's literally in danger. So how is he going to, you know, how, how is he going to get back to me? Right. So you can imagine her state. Right. And this is this is the issue with with tawakkul. Right. Literally, here's my problem. All you deal with it. And you know, subhanAllah, I mean, we have this in our lives, right? So let's just go put your trust in Allah and just, you know, seem, things seem like they're going wrong and everything, but then, you know, Allah takes care of them. But it's that moment, right? Uh, it's, that, it's that moment where, you know, where it all happens. And then Allah says, in, so look, she's human, but high human, you know, high rank, high level. You know, she's inspired directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah says in kanat latubdihi she almost let it slip she almost let it out my baby I've, I've had a child he's in the he's in the river he's in, he's in that box she almost let it out lawla arrabatna ala qalbiha if it wasn't for the fact that we tied her heart up so it's like imagine there's uh, imagine there are some strings 
and imagine there are some strings, uh, sorry, uh, some sticks. And if you just put them all together and try and make them stand, they might stand, but then they might collapse. But putting a rope around it and tying them up keeps them fall, uh, all firm as one, one, one group of sticks. So Allah is saying that if it hadn't been for the fact that we strengthened her qalb, her heart, she would have let it out. This is despite her great iman and all of this. So why, why does he use the, use the word qalb? Because when she was inspired this, she said, okay, I'm going to do what Allah said. And despite all of these painful emotions, you know, she's like, I'm going to do this. But then the word qalb comes from something that changes, something that flips, right? So she's on one state right now. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then it flips all of a sudden. Oh, um, I can't do it. I, I, you know, I have to tell them that my baby is there. Someone go get him. And just before it flipped and she was going to do it, or, you know, to prevent it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthened her heart. So the lesson in this is what? Is that when you have a difficulty, where do you go? Turn to Allah. It's as simple as that. إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَائِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ The Messenger of Allah said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Literally, it means, you know, introduce yourself to Allah when things are easy. Go get to know Him, meaning, you know, have a relationship with Allah. Rabbi, you know, make this dua, you know, call on Him when things are easy. And then when things are difficult, Allah will be there. Allah will, you know, look out for you. Yeah? So then, you know, so you have to turn to Allah. You can't just leave it like that. So this is what happens, and then <clears throat> so the Al of the, the, the followers of Firaun, his, his servants and soldiers, they, they pick up this box and they go <clears throat> and they take him <clears throat> to Firaun and his wife who come out. And she says, uh, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes her as Imra'a to Firaun. We talked about this before. They might, you know, they might have a good re relationship between them, but there's an issue, right? And some of the ulama say that, you know, they, they couldn't have, have children. But then there are some historical sources that say he might have had children. Allah knows best, right? But there, is, there was definitely an issue, which was Iman and Kufr. You know, his wife, what's her name? Asiya. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that her name is Asiya. And the historians mentioned Asiya bint Muzahim. Um, and, you know, she, she became a believer and Fir'aun tortured her, right? Um... And Allah uses her as an, as an example of an excellent believer uh, in Surah At-Tahreem. Right, so uh, she she sees Musa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِنِّي We cast love, you know, I, I cast love upon you. Meaning Allah made Musa such that whoever saw him fell in love with him. Right, this this beautiful baby boy that like whoever saw him is just gonna be like, no, I, you know, I, I, I love this child immediately. Right, so immediately she's attached to him. Fir'aun is also attached to him, and she says, "Qurratu aini li walak." Right, so it's beautiful expression. This right, so some people translate this "Qurratu aini" or "Qurratu ayun." Some people translate it as the the coolness of my eyes, and to be honest with you. Imam Raghib al Asfahani he says that, that the Arabs used to say that tears of joy are cool and tears of um, uh, sadness are warm. And I know what the Arabs are talking about, right? <laughs> All my tears are warm. <laughs> so if you have cool tears, let me know in the chat. But um, um, basically, what what does it mean? It doesn't mean it's it's, it's a mistranslation in the, in the the coolness. The word qarra, because qar actually does mean cold, right? But what qarra means is to be still. So the implication is that when someone's stressed or when someone's worried or panicking, you know, he, he's looking around. Let's say if you're in danger, you're gonna be looking around and you know what's going on, and you know you can't sit still. You know, there's this, this thing agitating you. But when you're completely relaxed. Your eyes just go still, like you're still. There's there's none of this panic looking about. There's just you completely relax. What do you do when you completely relax? You just close your eyes. You know this this complete relaxation. Um, so you're in comfort, right? You're in absolute comfort at that point. So qurratul ain or qurratul a'ya qurratul ainin. He in this situation, it would mean that the source of love and comfort, right? You know the source of them feeling loved and the source of them feeling comfort, right? Just you know, it's like when you see a baby. 
you know, you feel that, oh, he's so cute, whatever, and you get that feeling inside. That's basically what she's getting, right? Bahja, as, as I translated it in the past. And so she's, she's saying that, you know, he'll be a source of love and comfort for me and you to Fir'aun. لا تقتلوه, don't kill him, right? So they don't know if he's an Israelite baby or not. So, but she says what the Aziz said about um, Yusuf, don't kill him, Asa, Asa meaning it could be close soon, right? Maybe he'll benefit us soon, or we can adopt him, we can make him into our son. So, gives gives strength to the, to the indication that, you know, they didn't have children, right? And, you know, she's, you know, وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ right? they don't, You know, she's saying this, and they don't understand how things are going to end up, right? They don't know. Anyway. Uh, so, for Asbahu, for Ad Ummi Musa Farigan, her, her heart became empty of anything devoid of Musa. Allah said that, you know, had we not strengthened her heart, she would have let it slip. She said to his sister, Qusihi. So, her sister sees her, for, sees him from a distance, right? And from the other side, or from the side. And, you know, they don't know, right? So what happens? They take the child in, uh, and Musa at this point is obviously in love. You know, he, they've got good. He's got a good relationship. Not Musa, Firaun has got a good relationship with uh, Asiya, and so she. He says, "Okay, fine. Let's you know, let's take him in." And it's amazing how Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, this child who is literally his enemy, right? He's out to kill him. Had he known where he was born, just up the river, he would have killed him, right? But this child. Is in danger from you know the people of Fir'aun and where you know they, they're out to kill him and Fir'aun wants him killed. And where does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him for protection? To Fir'aun. Right? It's just amazing, you know. Allah made the source of his danger actually does you know the place where he's gonna end up, gonna end up uh, um, being uh, safe and protected. So then Allah says, We literally it means that we made it uh, haram for him to you know breastfeed from any other woman what the, the understanding is that musa alayhi salam would not drink any other woman's milk right so they would have you know there'd have been a call <coughs> call out <coughs> posh people in the past what did they do they had a, a wet nurse um if, if it was a lady of aristocracy she herself did, did not breastfeed uh, her child they would get someone a nurse or a nanny to come in breastfeed the child and to look after the child and then the mother would just play with him and you know, then you would do all the nappies, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so what happens is, um, he's not accepting it. As soon as they they would try to feed him, he'd just move move his face away, and he's only a, a child, hours old. You can imagine how fragile and you know he must be, and they must be panicking. You know, that he's not drinking. He's not drinking. What if he dies, right? You know, after this love that and com com compassion for him that's been placed into the into their hearts, they must have been panicking. So, I'm sure loads of women came and offered and whatever, and they all you know got popped off. Um, but his sister comes right, and she says, "Shall I tell you?" She, she says, "Shall I tell you about a family um, who who will be able to look after him for you, right? And they'll be really good. Wahum lahu nasihun, and they'll want the very best for him. They won't want any harm to come to him." So she's saying, she's making out like there's a lady, she's a very good lady, she's, you know, she's a pure person, a good person, and, <coughs> and you know, he will accept, you know, accept her, you know, he'll accept her milk, and she'll do, you know, she'll be very, very good to him, she'll look after him like he's her own. They said, yes, of course, bring her, right? So obviously, she comes back, and he's a test, she tries feeding Musa, there you are, he starts drinking. So this is like, yes, perfect. So, inna raduhu ilayki, we're certainly going to bring him back to you, promise fulfilled. And then the second one will be fulfilled as well. Yeah. So Allah says, faradadnahu ila ummihi, we said we returned him back to his mother. Right. So now here, so her eye can become still, literally. So she can be comforted by his presence and not be in a panic that oh my god what's happening so literally this might have been a few hours or a few days right and allah brought him back to her wala tahzan so that she doesn't also feel grief and for her to know that the promise of allah is true it's not empty words so the promise of allah is certainly true 
but most people are not aware of this right and obviously she's now seen it firsthand so um she knows this for sure and so basically what happens is <clears throat> allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions his story next when he's an adult so musa has grown up with her musa has grown up in the palace with Fir'aun and as a special you know like the prince of the palace right and <clears throat> so he's the prince of this palace and you know he's, he's been given the best education the best treatment all of this thing right raised as as though as, as though pharaoh's own son would have been raised and <clears throat> but he's had his mother there <clears throat> and his siblings obviously they, they have had a close link with them and but what's happened here is that she will have told him look i'm really your mother this is what we did and whatever and by his very nature he'll have become a believer right he'll have accepted this and it seemed like well, we see that he had a high degree of righteousness and it seemed like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also used to inspire stuff to him right before actual revelation came may maybe the the nature of wahi actual revelation the prophet gets is different to the nature of the inspiration uh, what he gets right but this is this is what happens and she tells him and obviously musa grows up and as a prophet you can see from his personality that he's not someone to um mince his words right <clears throat> he'll say something as it is and he's not someone who tolerate what's wrong so he's grown up and he's, he's actually been seeing that fir'aun you know <clears throat> his adoptive father has been torturing and persecuting and enslaving his musa's people for years <clears throat> since before his birth so this is something that doesn't sit well with anyone right <clears throat> if you've got a sound understanding of morality what's right and wrong and you see someone being wronged and you see a dhulm in front of happening to someone it doesn't it's not right you don't feel good allowing it so musa alayhi salam uh, he'll have grown up like this perhaps he had uh, i think he did have a, a strained relationship with fir'aun as he indicates as you know he's going to kill someone accidentally soon and as soon as they find out it's musa they make plans to kill him <coughs> <coughs> if he didn't have this strained relation a strained relationship with fir'aun maybe fir'aun would not have you know hastened to to do this if he had a good relationship he might have looked for alternatives but it's not the case but allah says and when he reaches his pinnacle of development right so physically his you know at full development and emotionally and you know mentally we granted him as a pure gift from us great great wisdom and a great amount of knowledge right same thing that was said about yusuf and no less than that in the same way do we reward those who excel in goodness so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala next says what does he say that <coughs> so he enters the city so now musa alayhi salam i'd say he's about 30 right he's in his prime uh, he, he allah says وَدَخَلَ الْمَدِينَةَ عَلَى حِينِ غَفْلَةٍ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا musa entered the city uh, so he's gone out or whatever and he comes back he comes back at a time when the people of the city are heedless what does it mean that a time where people are not out and about and so the, this is basically the hajira a hajira means it's the midday or just about midday it's the hottest part of the day and in places like that just like arabia egypt and it's so hot at that time you go inside and you have a nap right and you know most people historically used to sleep uh, in the day uh, in places like this you know and they'd, they'd, they'd be up and about before dawn right and the middle of the day they, they'd have a nap which helps <sighs> maybe i should have had one right or maybe you think talking about a nap is making me anyway um <clears throat> so so it, it helps so at this time people are about right this is empty ghost town and uh, you see medina is so the focus in this word for city is that it's a huge right it's it's, it's a big place well, he finds two men grown men there they're fighting they're in a fight a physical fight so the word shia 
is obviously here. Shia literally means the group. So the sect, is the, you know, the thing where the group of Ali. Right? So the Shia, so this one is, uh, this is from his group, meaning one of them is from Bani Israel and Musa knows him, or he can recognize from his features or his clothing or whatever he's from Bani Israel. Wahada bin Adur. And the other one is from his enemy. So it's as though he knows, Musa knows that Pharaoh and his people are his enemies. So like I said, there's tension already. You know, he must have spoken out, you know, why do you do this? Why do you enslave them? Shame on you. Uh, you know, he must have said some stuff, right? So the one who's from his Shia, his group, you know, he asks Musa for help against his enemy, right? Against that one. So Musa alayhi salam, he's seeing something. And like I said, you know, he's a person of, you know, this, this strong morality. And, you know, he's seeing that something is wrong. So maybe the other person was clearly overwhelming, overpowering, you know, this one. He's, uh, he's clearly wronging him. If the man wasn't being oppressed, Musa would not have, you know, taken his, his side, right? If he was, you know, if he was, you know, he might, might have tried to stop it or whatever. But here, Musa is taking his side. So Musa goes and hits the other man. Allah says, فَوَكَزَهُ فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ Right? So he punches, punches him and he finishes it. He kills him. Right? So we know in the hadith that Musa you know, took out an eye of the angel of death with a punch as well. Right? <clears throat> but, um, so, you know, imagine imagine that strength, right? To, there are certain ways and places you can hit someone, you know, to, to kill them. Uh, this is for educational purposes only. Right? <laughs> but if you punch... Uh, the bone of your nose and you can, you can go up obviously people you know about the temple and stuff like this right and uh, so don't say you know I've been telling you right so you know he hit him and he kills him you know with, with the force of his blow and then he's instantly he's not intended he didn't he didn't intend to kill him and we know it's, he would have wrongfully killed him because prophets do not sin right and that's the dominant position of Ahlus and Jama'a prophets do not sin so if you accidentally kill someone um, it's not a crime in some situations. Manslaughter, if it's proven that you know someone kills someone else, if it's proven that it's man, if it's through deficiency or you, know, or you know dereliction of duty or something like this, and someone dies, you know you could get a prison sentence. You could, but the lowest prison sentence for manslaughter is nothing. You go, you walk free, right? If it's shown that it's not in, in, intentional. Manslaughter being different to murder, murder with intent. So a crime, as I mentioned, you know, in British law anyway, there's two elements to a crime. There's the actus reus and the mens rea, Latin words. So the actus reus is the physical act of going and killing someone. And the mens rea is the intention. If either are absent, there's no crime. So if your intention is not there and you go kill someone, it's manslaughter. And if you got the intention but you don't do anything, it's nothing, right? So he goes and he kills, kills him. He's, and then he's called a hadha min amal shaitan In his remorse and regret over this, he says, oh no, is that, he said, this is the devil's work. What does it mean? Has the devil come and influenced him and made him do this? No, right? Prophets are protected. Uh, we know that Iblis said, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Iblis, inna, inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim min sultan. My cl true close servants, you've got no influence over them. So he can't have influenced him, right? <clears throat> but what's the issue? The prophets can't sin, but they can do something which is less than optimal suboptimal right you know what's the best thing you do and what's the next best and for them to pick the next best is something bad to quote unquote in there for them when they could have picked the best and what did he do he hastened he rushed into it right he should have took taken his time and assessed the situation what's going on maybe that man would have ended up dead ended up dead so he says this is something shaitan makes people do rush and hasten into this into thing it's a human mistake and but it was done from it came from a good place from a case of protecting the weak and the innocent and the oppressed and the downtrodden right so he says this is from the work of the devil innahu aduun mudillun mubeen he indeed the devil is an enemy who misguides misleads people and is open he's clear about this everyone knows this he declares it himself and <clears throat> so he didn't commit a sin but he's regretting doing this right and as we know a nadmu tawbah and uh, regretting something is tawbah. So then he asks Allah for forgiveness. Rabbi, qad rabbi inni nafsi, li, Allah. 
He said, my dear loving Lord, I've wronged myself, so forgive me. So Allah forgave him immediately. And it seemed like he was inspired this at that point. Innahu huwa al-ghafoor rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ghafoor, the one who forgives everything, no matter what it is. <clears throat> and Rahim, he gives gifts after that as well. So, you know, we'll end this here uh, on the last day of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll continue this with the stories soon, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this, our learning, our teaching, our research, our uh, education, of, you know, and our developing a connection to his righteous servants. And may Allah fill our hearts with love for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa and all the prophets. And may we be resurrected by Allah's generosity with them and may we enter and be with them in paradise together. Uh, with all those that we love so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to compensate for our deficiency in this month with his generosity our deficiency is finite but his generosity is infinite so we ask him to shower his generosity and mercy upon all of us and all the Muslims wherever they are wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.